Thank you very much for having me uh, over. It's a real pleasure. Uh, so I am supposed to give three lectures and Tristan will give three more in a couple of weeks. So of course, having so much time, we've decided to spread the topic quite a bit. And today I will mostly talk about motivation and then maybe a little bit at the end talk about um, proto-convex integration type of um, methods. But so today it's going to be a lot of uh, motivation and the motivation comes from hydrodynamic turbulence. So I'll review a little bit of the classical Kolmogorov picture, the Onsager picture, and then I'll get to some analysis questions. So, okay, so we start with uh, incompressible, so 3D incompressible Navier-Stokes. So we have an incompressible fluid and it's homogeneous. So we take the de density to be a constant. And if you take it to be a constant, it stays a constant. So we might as well not write it. So th then conservation of momentum is written like this. So you have here this upper sub nu reflects the fact that there will be a kinematic viscosity nu. So this is the acceleration as experienced by a particle moving with the fluid. And conservation of momentum says that this should equal the forces per unit mass. And there's three types of forces per unit mass. There's a force which is coming in a form of a gradient, which is maintaining the fluid to be incompressible. There's a force due to friction between molecules. And in this model, the model of the friction between adjacent molecules is given by the Laplacian, right? So this is modeling. So this is a Newtonian fluid with linear dependence of the stress tensor on the deformation matrix. And you could have other forces acting on the fluid, either because you're externally forcing the fluid or because it's coupled to a different equation. And Incompressibility, so this is conservation of mo momentum and conservation of mass, simply says that the divergence of u nu is zero. Again, I'm not writing density anywhere. Okay. And this parameter nu is the kinematic viscosity. And when nu is equal to zero, the same equation written here are the 3D Euler equations. And of course, I've written 3D here, and what, what is written on the board dimension doesn't matter, but for this talk, I will mostly be concerned with three dimensions. Uh, for me, the spatial variable will be in a three-dimensional torus with periodic boundary conditions. Uh, it's not that important, actually, for anything I'm talking about, but I think it's simplest to fix a setting and stick to it. And since we're working on the torus, we can just uh, remove the mean of the flow. So if the initial data has zero mean, then the solution and the force has zero mean, uh, then the solution has zero mean. So we'll wor uh, work with that. The pressure, I will not say much about the pressure. And the reason is that in this setting, it's always given to be a unique object. So if you normalize the pressure, again, you have to normalize it because you see a gradient here. So the pressure is actually just defined up to a function of time. So you take the pressure to have zero mean as well on the torus. And if you take the pressure to be zero mean, you take the divergence of this equation. If the forcing is divergence free, this term drops, but even if it's not, you always have minus Laplacian of the pressure is equal to the divergence of u nu dot grad u nu minus the divergence of the force. 
and if you normalize the force to have zero mean, uh, the pressure, sorry, this is a unique definition for the pressure. And for whatever I'm going to talk about, this will be always the pressure. And in particular, notice that if you're using compressibility, you can rewrite this term as divergence of the divergence of this tensor. So you have minus Laplacian is divergence divergence, so the pressure has the same estimates, morally speaking, as u squared. Okay, so this is just some basic uh, things about the equation. Um, what am I forgetting to say? Well, something about units. So we should maybe, for the purpose of this discussion, fix some units. So you may fix a unit u, which is a typical typical velocity unit. So what does that mean? You, you fix some unit. Maybe it's the uh, mean L2 norm of your data, maybe. That could be a definition. Okay. This has the units because we've so this symbol will always mean uh, divide by the measure. So this has the units of u a velocity squared and to the one half that defines a unit, and l will be a typical length. So in this case, it could be the size of the box, maybe. And my box is 0 to 2 pi squared, so cubed. So L will be 2 pi. So then you can look at the equation, and you will notice that every single term has the same units. So for instance, if you take a time derivative, um, you know, you divide by time, which is defined by quotient of these two, so you see that every term in the momentum equation has units of, uh, let's see, u cubed over L, u squared L inverse. Uh, wait, u squared or u cubed? No, oh, that's correct. And the kinematic viscosity also has some units. And the units are L times U. And this will matter. So in particular, it is common to define the Reynolds number as the quotient of UL divided by nu. And this is a dimensionless number. And what we will be mostly interested about in this discussion is what happens when the Reynolds number goes to infinity. which is the same as sending viscosity to zero while keeping u and l fixed. Okay. Okay. So that's just some basics about units. Uh, how about a priori estimates? There's only one known coercive a priori estimate for the 3D Navier-Stokes equation. And you see that by just taking the dot product of the Navier-Stokes equation with u itself. So just to take the dot product. And then you'll see that you have dt of the length of a vector squared 
For the nonlinear term, when you take the dot product, again, you can take the divergence outside, and you'll see plus the divergence of u nu, u nu squared over 2. For the pressure, when you take the gradient of the pressure dotted with u nu, that's the same as the divergence of u nu times p. So here you see the Bernoulli pressure. With the Laplacian, when you take the dot product, there is a term which is um, a minus nu gradient of u nu squared over 2. And there's a term which is not in divergence form. And then there's the force. So this if you have a smooth solution, it's an identity, which you can now integrate. And because you're in a torus with zero mean, the divergent term drops out. And you have d by dt of the kinetic energy is given by dissipation rate. And then the work of force. This is the only known a priori estimate for 3D Navier-Stokes, which is coercive. It controls the L2 norm in space uniformly in time, and it controls the gradient of U in L2, L2 in time. So if you have a bound on the force, what bound would you need on the force? You see, if this force is a gradient of an L2 function. Then you can move the gradient on the velocity, do cauchy schwartz So if the force is in L2 in time, h dot negative 1 in space, remember everybody has zero mean, so negative order sub of space is on the torus. Everybody knows how to define. Then u nu belongs to L infinity in time with values in L2. And moreover, you have an L2 in time bound for the gradient. OK, so this is the a priori estimate. And based on this a priori estimate, which is true for any smooth solution, so in particular, if you do an approximation of Navier-Stokes, like a Galerkin truncation or any kind of approximation, this is going to be true uniformly in your approximation scheme, and this is what Leray did. And Leray used this a priori estimate, and this integrated in time. Of course, if you have an approximation scheme, this bound is going to be uniform in your scheme, but then when you pass to the limit, this equality, because of lower semi-continuity, will become an inequality. So you will have what is called the energy inequality as opposed to equality. Okay? So for any initial data in L2, let's take zero mean, there exists u nu in the energy and force L2 in time, h minus 1 in space, that exists u nu in the energy class, a weak solution of 3D Navier-Stokes, which obeys the energy inequality. So let's call this the energy. Such that the energy at time t plus 
nu times the energy dissipation rate integrated from 0 to t is less or equal to the energy at time 0 plus whatever the force inputs plus dx dx. Okay. And of course, Leray's solution are a bit better than this. Uh, this L infinity in time is actually weakly continuous in time. So when you test against a fixed uh, smooth function, which is independent of time, then the inner product of u nu and that test function is actually continuous in time. And here you see there's two times, t and zero. And they appear here. And Leray's solution, of course, work with zero and t replaced by uh, tau and t for almost every tau positive and for all t bigger than tau. Okay, so there are bits. Th this is actually a stronger in information. And I haven't, of course, defined the concept of a weak solution, but let's just say for the moment, I guess I should write this down. <laughs> so definition u is a weak solution of Navier-Stokes or Euler So let's require at least some regularity in uh, time, let's say weekly continuous, because then we can make sense of uh, initial data. If u belongs there, for almost every time u is weakly incompressible, So that means that the divergence of u is zero in the sense of distributions. And the equation holds in the sense of distributions. So the integral of u against any test function minus the integral of the initial data against the test function at time zero is equal to the integral zero to time, the integral over space of the test uh, of u, sorry, dotted with dt of the test function. If you have Navier-Stokes, I need to write the Laplacian. If you have Euler, you don't have this term. And that's the weak form the equation with initial data u naught. So this should be true for all phi, which are C0 infinity in time, with values in C infinity of the torus, which is incompressible. Because I have not written the pressure term there, so I need to take incompressible test functions. Otherwise, I'm going to write the pressure test. OK, so this is the notion of a weak or distributional solution. And notice it's the same definition for Euler and Navier-Stokes. And what you really need is actually just L2 integrability in actually both space and time to give meaning to this. And this is, in some sense, the weakest notion of solution that you can have. Leray's solution is a stronger notion than this. Why? Well, first of all, because it gives you this extra regularity. But much more importantly, because of the energy inequality. <coughs> a 
And why am I saying this? You can ask yourself, for an array solution, is the energy inequality, <laughs> for a solution in the energy class, can you prove the energy inequality? And the answer is, well, to date, that's open, actually. So, open, does, do weak solutions in energy class automatically obey the energy inequality? It's really not known. There are conditional results, such as, yes, if you tell me more, such as you being L4. This is an old result of Shinbrot from 74. I, I would like to say that being L4 is not the same as being smooth. If I give you a array solution and I tell you in addition it's in L4, you cannot prove it's smooth. It's somehow below scaling. So this is um, a supercritical assumption, would imply actually the energy inequality but not regularity a priori, which is a non-trivial fact. Of course, the big open problem <laughs> is the uniqueness of the race solutions. in L2 in time, H negative one. And a smaller open problem was the existence of just weak solutions, the uniqueness of just weak solutions. And as I will mention with Tristan, we proved that this type of weak solutions are actually not unique, but our theorem does not apply to the Larray class. So I will talk about that later. Uh, what else did I want to say at this point? Maybe it would be nice to, to make f appear in your definition. Uh, it would be very important. <laughs> Thank you. So let's see. Uh, I've put a minus. Yeah, that's, the problem. that's the problem. There's either a plus or a minus uh, f, depending on. Um, depending on the definition of f. <laughs> Okay, so we've integrated, so if you put it yeah, there, you do one by parts. Oh, it's actually it's plus. It's, it's, it's plus. plus. Yeah. Okay, so we'll talk more about open problems and about Leray solutions, but let's go back to the energy inequality. Excuse me, I mean, I would like just um, maybe if you could comment on the open problem here. Yes. Uh, so it's more or less related to the fact that you, you are able to, to write the nonlinear term as a divergence term, maybe, or in a unity way? Uh, I will discuss this right now. I will, uh, so I will actually return to this. So I'll return to this later on, maybe on Wednesday, but I will discuss this now. Okay, so the point is, for a array solution, this is not... You cannot write this. So I was not even able to justify this equality in the sense of distributions. And this is of course related to what you were alluding to in terms of the nonlinear term. So what can you actually justify? <laughs> And what you can justify, I'll write somehow not in chronological order of what people did, but I really like this paper of Duchamp and Robert from 2000, who actually wrote down what you can justify. And what you can justify is the same thing plus another term, 
So let me write down. It's a bit repetitive, but... Okay, so that's the same left-hand side. And let me now put everything on the right-hand side. So you have the work of force, you have the energy dissipation rate, the classical one. And there's one more term, which is a distribution, d of u nu. And I will describe this distribution to you now. So d of u. So what Duchamp and Robert did, they revisited an old, um, um, how to say, identity in turbulence, which is called the karman horvath monin relation, which is again about writing something in divergence form. So they revisited it and they established rigorously that this d of u, you can write as the limit, as l goes to zero, one fourth. So this is a function of x and t. It's, a, it's a, not a function, it's a distribution of the average over the whole space. And I'll write some things now and I'll explain uh, what they are. The gradient of a modifier of z times a velocity increment and then the square of this velocity increment dz. So let me define things now. Where? So the velocity increment throughout my talk, so for z in R3, will be just u of x plus z t minus u of x t. So this is a velocity increment based on the point x t by the spatial distance z. And this phi l It's just an approximation of the identity, so it's L to the minus 3 phi of L inverse z, and phi is just some bump function of unit mass. So it's positive, even, you can even, by even I mean radial, <laughs> uh, of unit mass. You can even do it of compact support if you want, of course. So this is the identity established by Duchamp and Robert, that for any weak solution in the Leray class, this is actually an equality in the sense of distributions. Every, everything here is a distribution. But you were missing, we were missing before this term, which is the dissipation possibly coming through the nonlinear term. And notice that this limit has a very well-defined meaning. It's a limit as L goes to zero of what, right? The U, so remark, by interpolation, if U is in the energy class, L infinity L2 intersect L2 H1, in three dimensions, H1 embeds uh, in L6, and then you just interpolate, U belongs to L 10 thirds in space and time, and 10 thirds is more than 3. So in particular, this is a very well-defined L1 object. It's in fact more than in L1, so this, mean, this has a meaningful limit in the sense of L1 functions. Okay? And in fact, throughout the proof of Duchamp and Robert, this is used uh, throughout the proof that u is in 10 thirds. So that means that any trilinear combination has a very well-defined limit in the sense of uh, distributions. OK, so you can ask yourself, when is this distribution the zero distribution? <laughs> and it's not hard to imagine. You see, so without this gradient, this is a gradient in z, of course. Without this gradient, you know, this is an approximation of the identity. 
So shifts are continuous on L3, and this would go to zero for any L3 function without the gradient. That gradient will cost you, however, a 1 over L. If this approximation of the identity is compact support, then you know that the absolute value of Z is somehow related to L. So you could, in principle, divide here by Z to the 1 third. You can divide here by Z to the 1 third. And then you can put absolute value of Z there. And now you see the Z dZ doesn't have scaling. So this is now a good kernel, approximation of the identity. So if these objects are uniformly in L3, then again, you can hope to have a zero limit. And this is, of course, going to be related to the whole discussion about Onsager's conjecture and so on. OK, what else do I want to say? Two more remarks. D of u nu is positive for any Lerae solution. So for any Lerae solution, this dissipation is a signed distribution. And this has to do again with the energy inequality. And the last point I want to make is that if this u nu, you have a sequence of solutions to 3D Navier-Stokes. If you would for some reason know that they converge as nu go to zero to a solution u, which is a weak solution of Euler, in what sense converge? Strongly in L3. Then, so this is a weak solution of Euler, then you can prove that these measures converge. And as a consequence, this measure for the Euler solution also is signed. So if you can hope to construct a weak solution of 3D Euler as a limit of Lerae solutions, then you should get measures, uh, so, so, so weak solutions which are called dissipative. Because um, this term will not exist for Euler, and this term will have a sign. <laughs> I'm sorry, that's a minus. It's very important because otherwise <laughs> saying that this measure uh, is positive is uh, nonsensical. <laughs> Sorry. So you will get what is called the dissipative solution of Euler because in the absence of force, it only dissipates energy. OK. So in view of this result of Duchamp and Robert, let's write the correct energy balance which is d by dt of the energy. is <coughs> again the work of force. And then the usual dissipation and the mean of this measure. So the total dissipation of energy is coming from the combination of these two things. And in turbulence, um, I will discuss uh, I will discuss these brackets, what they mean. It's an average. Average of this quantity is typically denoted as epsilon nu. And it's what is this average? So 
For theoretical physicists trained in statistical mechanics, this is an ensemble average. You do this for all initial data, you put a measure on the, set, on the set of data and then you average with respect to that measure. In an experiment, what you can do is of course just run the experiment for a very long time. So then this would be a long time average, 1 over t integral 0 to t. And of course, in, in physics and statistical mechanics, you sometimes just make an ergodic assumption, um, you know, impromptu, and then they're, they're the same actually. Okay, so then the average against the ergodic invariant measure is the same as the long time average. And I will, for the rest of the uh, physics-y part of the talk, use these brackets to denote one of these way of averaging. We could just think of it as a long time average. So the point what I'm trying to make here is that the kinetic energy, you have input of force and then output of force, which is on average this epsilon sub nu. And it composes of two things. That's what I want to emphasize. So this is the mean energy dissipation per unit mass. And the zeroth law of turbulence which is an expression that I have learned was coined by my colleague uh, Srinivasan uh, states that when you send Reynolds number to zero, which is the same as sending new uh, Reynolds number to infinity, which is the same as sending new to zero while keeping U and L fixed, this epsilon new does not go to zero. So limit epsilon new strictly positive. And this is more commonly uh, called anomalous dissipation of energy. <laughs> of course, experimentally, you can measure things like this. And in particular, this mean energy dissipation rate per unit mass, let's say in an experiment in which you have a laminar flow coming and hitting maybe a ball, then it goes around, and then <coughs> turbulence. You can measure the drag on this ball, and the drag is proportional in terms of U and L to this energy dissipation rate per unit mass. And you will see maybe sometimes a picture in which the drag coefficient is a function of the Reynolds number. So the speed, so how do you alter the Reynolds number? <laughs> you increase the speed of the incoming velocity because you don't want to change new. You have one fluid in your tank. And if you here you have drag coefficient and here you have Reynolds number, a typical picture you will see is something like this. So you see something, a curve which is somehow wants to be 1 over the Reynolds number, also known as nu, which of course makes sense somehow for if the flow is smooth, this should go to 0 like nu and this should be 0. But then around 10 to the 4, you have transition to turbulence, you have boundary layers appearing, you have what is called the drag crisis here. And 10 to the 5, again, it stabilizes and higher and it really seems to converge to a constant. And this is one of the ways you can actually see in an experiment that uh, this zeroth law of turbulence seems to actually hold tremendous, with tremendously good error bars. So, excuse me. Yes. so somehow you have a transfer of uh, dissipation from uh, the first term to the other one. Somehow. Absolutely. There's an interplay between the two terms. And I, sh I should add that for me as a person working in fluids, this somehow would be my dream to prove this. So what do I mean to prove this? You're not going to prove this uh, maybe at the first shot with uh, averages and for almost every data and things like this. Just to give an example of a single data and a sequence of forces for which you can compute the long time averages and actually check that this is not zero. This would be uh, maybe a challenge for a different generation. 
Um, but okay, let's talk about math. Well, not really. I'll talk more a bit about physics. And I'll, since I mentioned this, this thing, I want to talk a bit about Kolmogorov, who in, in the early 40s made the predictions about homogeneous isotropic turbulence. And I just want to mention uh, one thing about it before I get to Onsager. Because uh, we will, in the third lecture, again return to some ideas of Kolmogorov. So I think it's important to know the motivation of why we even uh, uh, looked at this. So Kolmogorov makes some assumptions. So the first assumption, of course, is this one, that this number called epsilon is positive. That's an assumption. <coughs> And then he makes further assumptions that turbulence is homogeneous. Isotropic. And he somehow self-similar. In the inertial scale, a range. So what do I mean by this? So Kolmogorov introduces a length scale, LD, which is the dissipation length scale, at which somehow the fluid starts to convert energy into heat. And if you think about units, what's the unit of epsilon, by the way? Well, we have written on the board the unit of nu, and we can compute the unit of everything. And this turns out to be uh, u cubed. Uh, just one second, why am I blanking? Oh, u cubed divided by L. Okay. So if you have u cubed and you have L, the only kind of way to define a unit out of this is to define the dissipative scale as nu cubed divided by epsilon to the 1 over 4. Hi. So you see nu cubed will have units of u cubed L cubed epsilon, the l's, uh, sorry, the u's will cancel and you're going to have l to the 4. So for Kolmogorov, the 1 fourth power was the only one that could give you a unit of length. And the inertial range is defined as all length scales, which are like this, much larger than the dissipative length much smaller than what is called the inertial length. What is the inertial length? Imagine this force that I kept on writing, F nu, is actually band limited. Its Fourier uh, uh, transform is actually compactly supported. And let's say we call LD, Li inverse to be the largest active mode okay, for all nu. So you want the force to not act at super high frequencies. You want the force to only act at some finite number of frequencies. You pick that frequency and you call the inertial length to be 1 over. So Kolmogorov assumes that you have homogeneity. What does that mean? That if you look at the increment at uh, delta u, x, t, and z. And let's, instead of z, write z hat l. So z hat is an element on the unit sphere. l is a positive number. So homogeneity has to do with the fact that the law, in the probabilistic sense of this quantity, is the same for all x in the torus. Isotropy says that the law of this quantity is the same for all z hat on the sphere. And self-similarity states that, OK, roughly speaking, the law of the following quantities are the is the same 
if you put a lambda there, then in law, this should equal to lambda to a power times this. And this should be true when both this and this are in the inertial scale. Okay? So under these assumptions, I will... It's a bit um, informal at this point, but I will mention a theorem in a second. Kolmogorov makes predictions about structure functions. This is the main goal. So two types of structure functions, SP of L, which is just the L3, L, uh, the pth moment of delta U So what do I mean by the bracket here? It's, a, it's an average over space. It's the statistical average, so a long time average. So it's an average over time. And it's an average over all angles. So it's an average over S2. Okay, so everything is hidden in this bracket. So what is coming out is just a function of L. And that, of course, is defined as the absolute, the pth absolute structure function. And notice it has units of uh, u to the p. Okay. In fact, the most beautiful result in turbulence has to do with what are called longitudinal structure functions, in which instead of taking the absolute value here, very similar to Duchamp and Robert formula d of u, you take the average of z hat dotted the increment and then you take the square which is left. So how should I write this? Ah, let's just do this. Okay, so you just look at the increments in the direction of z. And the most beautiful result in Kolmogorov's theory, which is sometimes called an exact result in turbulence, says that the third order structure function, when you send L to zero, has a limit. Which is minus four over five epsilon L. So, <laughs> under this wiggle sign, uh, what is meant is that this holds for all L in the inertial scale, then you send viscosity to zero, so in some sense this goes to zero, and then you send the inertial scale to zero also. So this holds at infinite Reynolds number as L goes to zero. And there's a theorem actually, believe it or not, about this. There's a beautiful theorem by, it has four authors, uh, it's Bedrosian, Cotizelati, uh, Punch and Smith, and Weber. What are they doing? They're looking at Navier-Stokes forced, 3D Navier-Stokes, but you take this force, F nu, to be a forcing which acts on finitely many Fourier modes, but in time it's white. So it's Brownian motions, IID Brownian motions, jiggling the first, I don't know, 10 modes of, of Navier-Stokes. So in this setting, if your forcing is spatially homogeneous, so the law is translation invariant, then of course by the old uh, results, can be traced back, I guess, to Ben Susan and Temam or earlier. You can construct a sta statistically stationary martingale solution of stochastic Navier Stokes. So it's a weak solution in the sense of both probability and PDE. And now, for such a statistically stationary martingale solution, you have to make some assumption, which is like anomalous dissipation of energy. And the assumption that they make. And it's an if and only if, by the way. So if 
the limit as nu goes to zero of nu. But instead of writing the expectation of the H1 norm, I'll write the expectation of the L2 norm. Notice, no gradient. Okay, so this u nu now mm -hmm. is a statistically stationary martingale solution, so the law is independent of time, I don't need to write time. Then, you can of course compute sp of l, add to it 4 over 5 epsilon l, goes to zero, and there's a limiting process here, L some lim and some lim inf. Lim li goes to zero. Lim soup nu goes to zero. Three. three. Sorry, <laughs> sorry. Uh, this is very important. Sorry. This is only true for the third order structure function. So this is a. a a theorem, right? It's a math theorem. It's still a conditional theorem. But it's pretty remarkable because the condition is not that nu times the expectation of the h1 norm squared over goes to zero, but nu times the expectation of the l2 norm squared goes to zero. In any physically meaningful experiment, this is actually almost constant. So nu times that, not only does it go to zero, it goes to zero like nu. So this is a pretty uh, good evidence for Kolmogorov's for fifths law. And y working in this stochastic setting allows you to make sense of these averages and all, all these beautiful things. Okay. Um, this thing. <laughs> okay, now I need to start erasing. Mm. Maybe I'll erase that word. And by the way, when should I... Maybe in a couple minutes. Yeah. Of course, Komogorov made prediction about all structure functions. And his, ar his argument was that all structure functions, even the absolute ones, should scale like what scaling should say. So you should have units of u to the p. Epsilon times l has units of u cubed. So this should be epsilon l to the p on 3. And what's really remarkable is that from this you know, rather benign argument about scaling, you get an, uh, uh, an asymptotic law, which turns out to be pretty damn accurate for p close to 3. For p not very far from 3, if you look at an experimentally observed turbulence, this is really accurate. Of course, it's not very accurate for p away from 3, but it's pretty remarkable that still um, Kolmogorov for p close to 3 were mostly right. And it's not always right, if you look at zeta p, which is the structure function exponent. So you would do SPL, you would take a log, you would divide by the log of epsilon l, and you would take a limit as l goes to zero. Okay, you can define this number zeta p, which is called the structure function exponent. Then one beautiful picture that was compiled by Yuri L. Frisch in his book, based on all sorts of experiments at that time, was plotting zeta p as a function of p. And of course, Kolmogorov has the line p on 3. When p is 3, all experiments that I know of are on the money, which is to say that the four-fifths law pretty damn good. And then for higher order moments, this 
starts to go a bit down. And it, actually it's not even universal. There's all sorts of experiments which start to predict lower structure function components less than um, three. And what's even more interesting, since we are in a PDE setting, I think we all like HS. Um, when P is two, um, that's of course related to a Sobolev space. And what's really remarkable is that almost all experiments show structure function exponents above two over three. Okay, so here would be two over three. And this has to do with intermittency. And I will talk about intermittency when I will mention the convex integration constructions for Navier-Stokes. But for the moment, since we were uh, talking a lot about open problems, it's to date an open problem to construct a weak solution of Euler whose zeta 2 is more than 2 thirds. What does that mean? <laughs> okay. Um, if I write this best of space, of course the norm is roughly equivalent to this plus um, the soup over z positive of 1 over z to the s and then the velocity increment x z in lp in x and if you look at the absolute structure function so this is a velocity increment so if you look at sp L divided by L to the, well, zeta p. And we're taking the limit as L goes to zero. This should remind you of the best of space B, P infinity, zeta p. Uh, I'm missing a cube somewhere. Mm. Uh, da, 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 da. Uh, you know, the, the structure function is the piece power. So, for the, for the B, best of space SP, I should have length to the S, and it's to the P, so SP. So I, what I want, I guess, is this divided by p. Because otherwise uh, it doesn't work. So when p is 2, and this is where I was going for, this is best of zeta 2 over 2 to infinity. And zeta 2 more than 2 thirds means that this number is strictly larger than a third. And this is one of the most beautiful open problems in the field, is to show that there exist weak solutions of Euler, which go above the Kolmogorov scaling on the, let's say, HS sc scale, right? Best of two infinity HS, let's not discuss the difference there. Uh, this is, I think, one of the most beautiful problems. And how far can you actually push this number? There's an old theorem of uh, Sulem and Frisch, which says that you cannot push it more than 5 over 6 without something strange happening. But um, what's the most intermittent weak solution of Euler that you can possibly construct? This is how I would phrase this question in the sense of uh, physics -y language. And this is one of the most uh, beautiful problems uh, left. So, I think we should take a break, but I just want to say a little bit what I'm going to do next. So we've discussed a little bit this Kolmogorov picture. I didn't say much about intermittency because we would spend too much time. 
So now I want to tell you about the uh, Onsager part of this picture, and then I will start to mention some math theorems. Okay, so I'll we take a short break. Okay, uh, maybe uh, 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 a little puzzled by, by the signs of all these quantities because S parallel is, is something. Thank you. <laughs> okay, then it makes sense that it will. Well, it's kind of weird, right? Yeah. Why would the cube of something have a sign? Yeah, yeah, I, I agree, but it doesn't. But uh, there's no there's no contradiction. <laughs> yes, and and when. So, so then it's okay to, to divide. Because that's the absolute. Epsilon is positive. Uh, epsilon is positive and that's, I, I wrote there absolute structure functions. But you're absolutely correct. This was a parenthesis. This is one of the remarkable things. It says that on average, at small scales, this cubic term actually has a sign. Which, okay, what it really says is that the energy transfers from high scales to low scales. And that it's, on average, it's a one directional cascade. That's what it says. I do want to mention, before I switch to Onsager, I can't abstain myself from mentioning something about intermittency. Um, it's very hard to prove theorems about intermittency because even defining it is a strange uh, thing. Intermittency really, in a broad sense, means deviation from Kolmogorov. Okay? Uh, but uh, there's a very nice paper of Chesky Dov and Schwitkoy. In which they attempt to define intermittency in terms of saturation level of Bernstein inequalities. So you can look at the little Perry decomposition of any flow. And what people in turbulence sometimes measure is they measure what is called the skewness factor. They take a structure function different from three, they raise it to the correct power, they divide by the third order structure function to the correct power, and they check how this scales. And if there is deviation from Kolmogorov, this will capture it. So these guys, they define some volumes which they call active volumes. So imagine you have the torus and then you do an atomic decomposition or some wavelet decomposition. And then you look at the boxes in which there's a lot of energy transfer to small scale. The union of those boxes define a volume and you can try to estimate the volume of that volume. And these guys define it like this. So it's the average. So by average, I mean spatial average and long time average of the littlewood paley shell squared power 3 divided by the littlewood paley shell cubed squared. Right, so this is like a Bessel, a, a L2 based Bessel space. Mm -hmm. Relate, it's related to. This is related to an L3 based Bessel space and you can define this for all Q. And again, this is meant to be, if you look at, it, at scales of size 2 to the minus q, you divide the torus into boxes of size 2 to the minus q, this is somehow the volume uh, at which stuff happens. And then you can define an intermittency dimension to be 3 minus liminf as q goes to infinity. So this is uh, related to 2 to the q, so let's take log base 2 of L to the minus 3 vq, and let's define this by q. Okay, so this turns out is related to the old work of uh, Frisch, Sulem and Nelkin about the so-called beta model for intermittency in which they propose as a way of showing deviation from the Kolmogorov theory, what is called a bifractal picture, that there's a certain proportion of the energy which gets transferred to smaller scales at all scales. And this dimension is a number which you can define, this, the, the reason I bring it up, because this is just a number that you can define for any flow. And it really measures saturation of Bernstein's inequalities. If you, if you imagine that you um, it's, sorry, delta Q of U. So in this annulus, 
you have a volume fraction of active frequencies. Maybe this fraction is a restriction of a plane, or maybe it's a full three-dimensional thing, or then this number will change. And these guys prove a very beautiful theorem. That if d is more than three halves, then the any array solution with d more than three halves is smooth. So if you take a array solution, compute this number, and if you somehow get more than three halves, that's the same as regularity. It turns out that this condition implies Prodi-Serin criteria, it implies Bilkatomida for 3D Euler, somehow it implies them all. It's somehow related, three halves is related to scaling. What do people in turbulence actually observe? People actually in turbulence measure these things. And there's a, a long history of measurements. My colleague Srinivasan again told me a long history, but there's a big simulation at very high Reynolds number that was done in Japan in 2003 by a group of Kaneda. So direct numerical simulation. And D is 2.7 something. So when people observe turbulent flows, they observe, in fact, smooth solutions. The thing that does not remain um, bounded is that, okay, so <laughs> when people observe turbulent flows, this is computed on a smooth object, in particular the Duchamp Robert measure is zero. What, what's, what somehow goes on in, in this limit is that you don't have bounds uniform in viscosity, right? So these bounds degenerate in viscosity. So that's really what's happening. And I only brought this up because in my view, this discussion of turbulence is not a discussion related to the clay problem, which is the blow up of 3D Navier stock. Somehow these, to me, these are completely distinct problems. This is, however, related to weak solution of 3D Euler, not of Navier stocks. And this is what I, where I want to go now to uh, Onsager's picture of ideal turbulence. So instead of looking at Navier-Stokes, Onsager, well, he did look at Navier-Stokes, but he wanted to see if it's possible in an Euler flow to dissipate energy by itself without any viscosity. And now that we've introduced uh, the measure there, so we know that the kinetic energy dens density obeys this for an Euler flow. And what Onsager is really talking about is the fact that this measure is not the zero measure, that it really has mass in it. Of course, Onsager didn't write this measure, he didn't write it in this language. Uh, what he really did is he did actually a Fourier series. He truncated the Fourier series at a finite scale. He did a computation and he introduced the object called flux of energy um, through frequency shell at a certain frequency parameter, let's call it kappa. Okay, so you look in Fourier space, you look at, let's say, the boundary of the ball of radius kappa, and you're trying to measure how much energy is flowing out through that. 
So let's do this computation really in the spirit of uh, Onsager. And let's forget a little bit about this. So to do this picture, we need some kind of, again, what Onsager did is he did a truncation in Fourier space. So let's write projection less than kappa to really mean a truncation in Fourier space. It would be much better to use little Paley. So kappa, if you want to think about, should be 2 to the j for some j. In particular, it commutes with time derivatives and with um, uh, spatial derivatives. OK, so what I want to do is I want to first say that the energy at time t is, of course, by dominated convergence theorem, the limit as kappa goes to infinity of the kth energy, where this is just the energy in the projection. Okay? Just DCT, dominated convergence theorem, says that if u is L2, this is true. Okay? So if you want to look at energy conservation, Let's look at the energy minus the energy at time zero. And of course, this is going to be equal to the integral from zero to t of dt and I should I'm missing something. Yes. Okay, so this is fundamental theorem of calculus which is, of course, justified because you, the projection of u is smooth. Now here, I can just use Euler. So let's put this first. So this is minus the projection of u tensor u. I'm forgetting the divergence. Maybe let's write, ah, let's do it like this. Gradient of P. And what am I missing? The force. Okay. So these commute, so, so, do, so do these, so we can integrate by parts. This term will become a divergence, which is zero. This will not become a divergence. It will become something else. How about this one? This will just be what it is. We're not going to do anything with it. Because again, remember that for k large, for kappa large, bigger than some fixed inertial frequency, the force is, what I'm trying to say is that we assumed anyway the force was frequency localized. Okay, so this is a constant. Doesn't even depend on kappa. Okay, so this times this will converge strongly to u dot f. Okay, so let's write this like that. Okay, so let me not write this. Let's the same kappa is large, and then I still have plus, I'm taking this divergence by parts, it becomes a gradient. So here we have gradient of u. So this is a matrix which is contracted against this matrix. Okay. Now, of course, if this Fourier projection operator would go on this u directly, this would be zero because of incompressibility. But it doesn't, right? I mean, projection operators, uh, or in terms, in general, Fourier multipliers don't commute with nonlinear objects. But it means that we can subtract for free zero. So the zero we're going to subtract is this.
So what we've done here is we've subtracted zero because the way that this contracts now it's on smooth functions and incompressibility says that this term that we've added artificially is zero. So you can define now the flux density little pi sub kappa of x and t and you can define the integral of that to be capital it's common to use why did I keep these I didn't have to keep them so you can define pi kappa to be the average flux of energy through shells which is still a function of time. Oh. Now, of course, in terms of what we've done, you can now send kappa to infinity. And theorem, essentially due to Ansager, but of course he didn't write things exactly like this, but pretty close. In the absence of force, kinetic energy is conserved. if and only if the limit as kappa goes to infinity of the flux is zero. So again, this pi sub kappa is the flux of energy through the, little, through the frequency uh, of order kappa. And what we have proven upon sending kappa to infinity is this theorem. But Onsager did a bit more. He predicted, in some sense, when this is zero. So I'm going to use a, a simple computation. We can write down a pointwise identity for what this is actually equal. at every x and t. So if you think about what this really means, you're going to get one contribution when both of these, you keep only the high modes. So the projection on strictly more than kappa of u, tensor projection of strictly more than kappa of u. And there's a remainder term. And this remainder term has an explicit formula. Basically, it's the uh, integral of, what is it, kappa to the minus 3. It's the inverse Fourier transform of uh, pi sub kappa. So it's kappa to the power 3, some kernel h which is basically related to the inverse Fourier transform of your... So this is the kernel you get from inverse Fourier transform of projection less than kappa, and then increment of u at distance z, tensor increment of u at distance z. Okay, so the point is, this is defined only in terms of increments. So this is u of x plus z minus u of x, and this is u of x plus z minus u of x. So in particular, by the way, this identity was written down by Constantine E and TT. T. 
but of course, it's just the Bonny uh, decomposition of the literal Paley projection of a product. And Onsager had something very similar except with Fourier series, so it's a bit harder to untangle. But he had something very similar. So let's bound these two terms. So if u has alpha regularity, what do I mean by this? That an increment scales in a certain sense, like z to the alpha. So in what sense should this increment scale? Well, we have a trilinear term. So if I want to put all the u's in the same LP, I have three u's, so I should put things in L3. So if u has alpha derivatives in L3, <coughs> that means that when you divide here by z to the alpha, z to the 2 alpha, and now you take the L3 halves norm, L3 halves norms means you're putting L3 here, L3 there, and L1 on the kernel. The best of space exactly says that the L3 norm of this is bounded independently of z. This is bounded in L3 independently of z. But the kernel produces a kappa to the minus 2 alpha, because this is a well, very beautiful kernel. So that's a bound. On the other hand, this is really easy. We just put the L3, L3. And the fact that you only have high modes means you can translate any type of regularity into decay of the little Paley pieces. So this is exactly the same proof. It's not the same, it's easier <laughs> than this. And lastly, I need to bound this guy. So we've bounded this, and we're left with bounding that. So I wonder, I didn't choose the correct order. Lastly, the gradient of the low modes of u. So if we put those things in L3 halves, we said that we're going to put this in L3. The gradient, of course, would cost a kappa, but then we have alpha derivatives. So in total, what we have shown is that the flux is less than kappa to the 1 minus alpha and minus 2 more alphas, so you get 3 alphas. And this is exactly the computation from the paper of Constantin E and TT. Everything I've just shown here. And as a consequence, um, the limit is zero if alpha is more than a third. So 
this is the proof of energy conservation, a la Onsager, but really in this modern language, as done by Konstantin ENTT. And it really shows you that if you have more than a third of a derivative in L3, essentially, um, then you conserve energy. Now, all sorts of questions arise after this, and in fact, Onsager was a very smart man. He didn't just say this, he also said that there is the opposite, which is true. And some people refer to this as the Onsager conjecture, which is now, in the way I'm going to write it, is a theorem. And uh, the old way that people wrote this was not using Besov spaces, which is the correct way to write it, but using Hölder spaces. And it had two parts, rigidity, which states that for any weak solution, U of 3D Euler, of course, which belongs to, again, I'm going to write it in this old-fashioned way with Hölder spaces, C alpha with alpha more than a third. Any weak solution in C alpha with alpha more than a third, energy is conserved. Or if you have force, the energy balance holds. Slash conservation. If you don't have force. And B, flexibility. For any alpha less than a third, there exists at least one weak solution of 3D Euler in this space, which dissipates energy. Again, in the absence of force. So maybe let me write both statements in the absence of force so that it's cleaner. And what we have done here is we've done the proof of the first part of the conjecture. And again, we have discussed the fact that these spaces should be really L3 in time of alpha 3 infinity in space. That's what you really need for energy conservation. Now, several questions appear. I have omitted on purpose the number one-third because funny things happen at one-third. So let's look at one cautionary tale. Okay, before that, look at the quantifiers in the flexibility part. For any alpha, there exists a weak solution. Is it true that for any weak solution in C alpha, energy is dissipated? Absolutely not. Take a shear flow, which is C alpha. It's a shear flow. It's a stationary solution. It does not dissipate anything. So, of course, there will be outliers in C alpha in which energy will actually be conserved. Turns out that's a very thin set. It's a meager set in terms of bare category. Um, second, if you take 1D burgers, the proof of rigidity works the same. And you can prove the same theorem. But we know that in 1D burgers, you have energy dissipation through shocks. In which space does a shock live? And the answer is, a shock lives in B one third three infinity. And emphasis on this infinity, you really have that every little Paley piece, even as you send Q to infinity, carries constant mass. 
So how about Euler? If I have a solution in the endpoint space, does it conserve energy? If I pick a random one, probably not. But for instance, if you look at the vortex sheet, okay, so you have a nice and smooth sheet, and let's say you have a flow going like this on the top and like that on the bottom so that you have two laminar flows, then the vorticity is a distribution supported on this sheet. This is why it's called a vortex sheet. If this is smooth, then in this direction, you have kind of, it's, everything is regular, right? But if you go in this direction, it really looks like a shock. It looks like plus one and minus one. This also lies in there, but it conserves energy. Although in And this was proven by Roman Schwitkoi. And there's a physical reason for this. You know, in, in a shock, particles come and they can jump across the shock, right? They sorry, not jump across, they jump into the shock. It, it, they alter the speed of the shock. In a vortex sheet, particles in here and particles there never exchange sign. They stay on top or they stay on the bottom. They never exchange. So there's a physical mechanism why at the end point, very curious things may happen. And this is one of the other very interesting problems left in this story that, I, that we're talking about. What happens at one third? Is it more like this? Is it more like this? What's the generic one? And so on. So as I said, we have proven this and the way this is stated, this is also a theorem now, due to Philip Isaac. Well, Philip Isaac proved this theorem. He constructed solutions with compact support in time, so in particular they do not conserve kinetic energy. And then jointly with uh, Delelis and Sekerehidi and Buckmaster, we have proven uh, this statement about uh, dissipative weak solutions. So, the way it's written, the Onstager conjecture is closed, and I will want, I basically want to tell you the story about how, how it got to this point. Okay. Um. Anything else here? Ah, I do want to say one more thing, since we discussed so much about this flux. So I'll bother you a bit more with the flux. Are these Onsager and Kolmogorov stories related? And the answer is yes, and the flux relates them. And again, you have a, a nice discussion of this in Uriel's book on turbulence. So let's again say that we have a stationary solution of both Navier-Stokes and Euler. So that means that when I take these averages, the value at time t and the value at time zero is the same. So then what's left of the energy balance? Well, in Navier-Stokes, what's left of this computation <laughs> is that the flux, let, let's put an upper new just so that we know it's Navier-Stokes through shells at level k on average plus nu times the average of gradient is balanced by the force. And 
the only thing that I've assumed here is that these brackets, which maybe denote a long time average or something, forget the left side. You have statistical stationarity in time. How about Euler? In Euler, we've just having this. Okay, what happens when we send k to infinity? Kappa, sorry. Well, this is very clear what happens. <laughs> you have strong convergence. Because you have, well, f is fixed. How about here? What should we write? And I've just erased it, but when kappa goes to infinity, if you again think of this Duchamp and Robert energy balance, it's exactly what we called epsilon upper nu, because we're putting this average. So all these limits are as kappa goes to infinity. How about in Euler? Well, here you can give it two different meanings. It's either that limiting flux, or equivalently, the average of the Duchamp and Robert measure, because it's the same. So now send nu to zero. So, so far kappa to infinity in Navier-Stokes and in Euler. Kolmogorov says that when you send nu to zero, this has a limit. But, and now comes the interesting punchline, when you send nu to zero here, If the statistically stationary solution of Navier-Stokes converges just weakly in L2, because this is a smooth function, it's frequency localized, just weakly in L2, if it converges to a statistically, st statistically stationary solution of Euler, then this goes to f dotted with u. Okay, But these two are equal. <laughs> so that means that Kolmogorov's epsilon is exactly matching the limiting energy flux or the average of the Duchamp Robert measure. So these two stories of Onsager, which really deals with this flux, and the story of Onsager, which deals with the positivity of this epsilon, is actually the same story. Under some mild assumptions about the existence of stationary states, and their convergence weakly in L2. Okay. So we have this beautiful picture that uh, all the predictions of Kolmogorov about structure functions and so on, we can also try to convert into Euler. And in some sense, this is the connection between the Kolmogorov picture and the Onsager picture. Okay. And that's all I'm going to talk about, about uh, fluxes. But really, all I want to say is that it's somehow two coins of the same story. By the way, you see, I'm, I'm again saying that I'm not going to talk about fluxes, but I want to say more. <laughs> I guess in this crowd, I can say more because you're familiar with little Paley decompositions. If you look at flux through 2 to the j, there's a paper by Cheskidov, Konstantin, Friedlander, and Schwitkoi, which do a much more careful bound than this. They really do the Bonnet decomposition properly, and they bound things properly. And then you get a very interesting bound. 
sum over i zero to infinity. So this is a little Paley decomposition from negative one to infinity. We don't go to zero because we are on the torus of zero mean. There's a kernel of i minus j, absolute value. So j is that j, i is summed. And here we have two to the i, delta i u, L3 cubed. So this, if I take supremum over i, is exactly what defines the endpoint space. If I take supremum. What is this kernel? <laughs> this kernel of any number, I don't know why I wrote it like this. There's no absolute value. Okay, this could be negative or positive is 2 to the minus 2 thirds q for q negative and 2 to the minus 4 thirds q for q positive. So this is really an exponentially decaying kernel both when i is much lower than j and when i is much more than j. And it has different numbers, a priori. So two things. This bound says, because of the, this exponential kernel, that the flux through, through to the j is mostly affected by little Paley shells for i close to j. The flux is somehow local. It's very improbable that something will come from infinity and talk to you. Second, the forward cascade stronger than the backwards cascade, so that on average you have a forward cascade. Okay, and this is an a priori estimate for any weak solution. And, um, okay, that's all I wanted to say, that as far as I know, this is the best estimate on the flux that I'm aware of. Okay, so now we will really start to talk about basically the flexible part of Onsager's conjecture. So in what way can you prove flexibility? In at least three ways that I'm aware of. They all work through convex integration or a method related closely to convex integration, but they prove various degrees of things. So A, you could just try to show that energy is not conserved. then what you've done is really constructed something strange. So it's not exactly what Onsager wanted with dissipation of kinetic energy, but it's definitely going to give you, let's say, non-uniqueness, because maybe you can construct infinitely many of this. So this will automatically imply, if you can do many of them, non-uniqueness. How do you do this? In practice, you either do compact support in time, That's one way to prove that energy is not conserved. And then if it has compact support in time, then at some point it's the zero function. So zero is a solution. And then you've constructed another solution. So it does improve Im implied non-uniqueness. Or you can prove that the energy doubles. Because then you have a solution which increases energy, and then maybe you construct one which decreases energy. So you have, again, two solutions. You could try to prove that there exist infinitely many dissipative solutions. So 
So maybe you can even do more. You can maybe even prescribe their kinetic energy. So statements of this kind work as follows. You give me a smooth positive function of time, I'll give you a weak solution in a certain regularity class whose L2 norm squared divided by 2 is exactly that function. So that has a prescribed kinetic energy and in particular if you take your energy to be decreasing then you've constructed dissipative solutions. Okay. Or you could have much wilder uh, type of flexibility, which is related to Gromov's H principles. So that means that maybe you can prove that the set of weak solutions, which let's say dissipate energy, not only are there infinitely many, they're dense in the set of all functions with a prescribed mean. are dense in some very big space. That space could be the space of subsolutions, which I will introduce later on. Okay, and these, of course, may seem like they're increasing difficulty. They are. A is easier to prove, B is a bit harder, C is a bit harder, but in some sense they are you proved using the same technology. And in terms of proofs, the first one was a part A type theorem due to Vladimir Schaeffer. Like many things in PDs, they were invented by Vladimir Schaeffer, who I think only had 13 papers. Um, and he constructed a weak solution, compactly supported in time, compactly supported, let, let me write type A, uh, just L2. So he found some solutions which, had, which were square integrable in space and time, but in addition he knew from the construction that they were compactly supported actually both in physical space and in time. He did this on R3. Schaeffer's construction is a bit hard to read, to say the least. Then Schneemann he had two papers in 96 and in 2000, and I will cite the 2000 one because it's the first example of a B type result. Schneerlmann proved that there exist actually dissipative, infinitely many dissipative solutions. Which have bounded in time kinetic energy because they're dissipative, but there is still <coughs> L2 in space. So both of these results somehow have this little issue here, that they're L2 in space, which is great if you're just caring about kinetic energy, but it's not so great if you want to get to Hölder one-third. And in terms of the proofs, it, it's not clear at all if they produce anything in LP for P more than two. So it's, it's not very clear um, what, um, follows from there. By the way, I should say that in terms of dissipative weak solutions, they are in principle different from just regular weak solutions because you have weak strong uniqueness. If you give me two, if you give me a solution, a weak solution of Euler whose energy is decreasing and you have for some reason a strong solution with the same data, then they must be the same. Okay, so you have this weak strong uniqueness type result. And this is why, in principle, there should be more obstructions uh, to that thing. Okay, and then the breakthrough, or the first breakthrough, 
came through the work of Delalis and Sekelihidi, And I'll cite at this point one more paper and I will tell what the difference is. In the first paper, they basically realized that these constructions fall under the same umbrella that was known for a long time in geometry in the world of differential inclusions and was titled convex integration. And they managed to basically realize that this method of convex integration from differential inclusions could be applied to the Euler system. So they prove a B-type result, which of course is stronger than an A-type result, and a C-type result. So they prove all these types. For bounded solutions, and that was the big uh, thing. And this was not just, basically the importance of this result is not just that it achieved an infinity. It's more the proof. It, it realized that you can place this, um, these very non-physical constructions for 3D Euler into a rich and old and established geometrical framework of convex integration. So instead of, so I will tell a little bit about this result, but really I would like to emphasize at this point that this proof gives you L infinity but not more. The convergence you get, so the construction, is because something converges weak star in L infinity. This will never give you C0. So this method can't give easier and I will try to uh, somehow do a cartoon of, of that so what is the correct order I don't know So I want so I want to basically tell you the theorem they've actually proven and then instead of giving you the proof I'll give you the proof of a toy theorem but I want to first not, not start directly with the toy because it's going to seem out of the blue so I want to first really say what theorem they proved so let me discuss a little bit first the concept of a Reynolds stress And at some point, somebody should stop me. Uh, yes, yes. Because I'm going to keep uh, going. Uh, maybe it's about, the, it's about the time, but maybe you can ah. just finish this, okay. or how long does it take? No, this uh, will take probably at least 20 minutes. So, so maybe, maybe it's better. To before tomorrow, I will give you an exercise. <laughs> yeah, okay, good. Do this. Okay. <laughs> Find all, not all, find as many as you can. Uh, U, 0, 1 into R, such that U is bounded. And, well, this is stupid. Uh, U of X in absolute value is 1 for almost every X. <laughs> this implies the other. <laughs> So let me erase. <laughs> and note, if u is continuous, there are exactly two such functions.
right? One is plus one, one is negative one. <laughs> uh, but if it's bounded, there are infinitely many. And in fact, they're uh, of bare category, uh, the one which is many of them. And this is the toy example that uh, you can also find in the paper of Camillo and Laszlo. So I will start the next lecture by writing down what they have actually proven. Then I'll give you the proof of this as a toy. So this is toy convex integration, really. And then I will want to go through painful details of the big step in this program, which was to get from L infinity to C0. It may not sound like much, but that was a big conceptual step. And then I'm going to show you actually convex integration in action in C0. And that's not going to be so toy like this. It's going to be a bit more intense. After that, there was a race to get to C1 third, and I will leave it to Tristan to tell you about that race. And on Wednesday, instead, I will go back to Navier Stokes. So again, the plan for tomorrow is to tell you a little bit about L infinity and a lot about C0. I'll let Tristan tell you about C1 third. And then on Wednesday, I will talk about Navier Stokes. And I'm sorry for going a bit over time. Okay. So we'll resume at, uh, tomorrow at 10. Thank you very much.